Thank you very much. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, we've already met uh, Florian, uh, but I'm going to get the other guys to uh, introduce themselves, um, just give a, a one or two liner on um, uh, where they come from, what they've done, what their experience is, um, and then we'll get into some questions. I'm going to ask some questions first that we've um, prepared that hopefully will be interesting to this audience, um, and then we'll see how that goes, and we'll throw it open to the floor and hopefully get some questions. So start thinking about some, some difficult questions. Uh, Florian, if you can briefly introduce yourself and then hand on. Yeah, I, I think you just saw me. Um, don't, yeah, that's still working, so i hand that on. Um, Florian Diederichsen, I'm the CTO at Zone. Um, have been in, in sports pretty much all my life, mostly sports data. Um, joined Perform in 2013 and yeah, have never looked back. I mean, I think the Zone is a really fantastic opportunity to move sports on. Um, sort of second or third time I had this honor in my life and yeah, very happy there. Thanks. So my name is Paul Shepard. Um, I'm head of software architecture and engineering at JP Morgan for GTI. So that's their infrastructure division. Um, I'm a software engineer by trade. Spent 20 years building applications, mainly in investment banks, um, and now spend my time trying to improve the environment in which other people develop software investment banks. Toby Wright, CTO here. Um, I've spent most of my career in technology. Started off working in semiconductor manufacture, then wholesale media, now retail media, as I like to call it. I'm Rory Gibson. I've got a background in Java development, closure development, and agile coaching. Uh, spent a couple of years at Sky Betting and Gaming, running a petabyte-sized data cluster there. And now down in London as an interim CTO, working with a couple of organizations. Hi, Steve Homan. I'm CTO at Metapack, a tech company. Uh, previously, I ran tech at the Daily Mail Group, uh, Fitness First, and various other things. Great, so thanks this. guys. Uh, pass it back this way, I think. <laughs> um, so um, I'm a CTO myself. Uh, the idea being that I might be able to understand some of the answers they've given you and direct them in the right question to hopefully get an interesting evening. Uh, the difference <coughs> between uh, me and these guys is that uh, they've all got jobs and I don't. Um, so uh, I'm an interim CTO, so if anybody wants one of those, let me know. Um, okay, uh, Florian, I think we'll, we'll come to you with the first question. So um, Mark talked about uh, a large team that he's got. You talked about an even bigger team. I know that uh, some of the gents here have got, have got some sizable teams. Uh, most of us are basing our teams in London, somewhere a, a, a little bit up towards the Midlands and the North as well. Um, what's the challenge around attracting talent and how do you deal with that in terms of a balance of permanent members of staff, non-permanent members of staff, third parties, etc., etc.? Yeah, it's a big problem. It's definitely a seller's market at the moment. Um, if you are a developer who's halfway worth the salt, you can really choose where you want to be. So I think us as, as the people um, responsible for building these teams have to provide really interesting projects first and foremost because um, that's obviously the, the one thing which is most interesting together with a really um, nice environment you can't get away with just putting people on this bench and um, uh, having a three to a square meter that doesn't work anymore um, and at the same time uh, exploiting the cost benefits and um, sort of the yeah, differences in availability and, and people being hired between um, locations. So we just opened up, or last year opened up a development center in Amsterdam where we have 150 people now. Um, has worked very well for us and um, for whatever reason Amsterdam was very un much under in appreciated in, in today's markets. Mark um, spoke around um, the culture between development centers um, earlier. This is a big issue. Um, if you have, we have people in Poland, we have people in Slovakia, um, some in Leeds and London, big cultural difference there. Um, a lot of them in Amsterdam. Amsterdam very diverse, where we hire in people from all over the world because it's relatively easy to get people into the Netherlands. And bringing all of them together um, and rallying them behind a cause is hard. But you have to do that, you know, because otherwise you won't be successful. I mean, the other thing I mentioned it earlier, Mark mentioned it as well, build small teams make them nimble, explain to them what they, need, what they need to do, and then let them go. If you can make that happen, you stand a good chance that you can keep your management overhead manageable, and at the same time, um, get quick success out of your teams. 
Okay. Toby, you, you've got a great brand. Does that help attract that talent or, or does that sometimes come as a double-edged sword, do you think? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the attraction here is people can do work that millions of people see on a daily basis and they're looking at on a daily basis. That really helps. So, when we, you know, we, so we, we, we do push that. We're in hiring. But one of the things we also do is, given that most people want to work on fun things or some interesting technology and want to learn, we occasionally will make technology choices that might look a bit sort of odd, but because we know people want to use that technology. So we'll try and see what people are working on, see what some of the, the newer frameworks are and some of the new technologies and say, okay, let's migrate to that. When, you know, sometimes you say, well, that's a bit foolish because this works perfectly well. Why would you move to that? But it helps because it keeps people, you can come and work here and you can certify on two cloud platforms, two cloud platforms, I meant to say, or you can certify on two sort of major programming languages versus having to go to two different companies. And that seems to work really well. I mean, it means people are always on, on sort of, Lots of certification challenges as well, and it helps progress people because if you weren't didn't fancy that, because we're a small company, we've got a fairly small tech team. Um, it's always a challenge to provide progression. So you know, putting different technologies in the mix and new ones that people have to learn gives people more more reason to stay around. Frankly. Okay. Cool. So, uh, Rory, uh, you got anything to add to that in terms of particularly focusing around? Diversity. I'm, I'm conscious that our audience are probably looking at us and probably thinking pale, male and stale. Uh, you're more diverse because you've got a beard, so perhaps you could <laughs> answer I'm, this I'm question. I'm still pale though because I'm Scottish. Um, <laughs> I think there's a couple of different angles to it. Um, first I wanted to pick up on a little thing there around the technical challenges that people work on are important, but also sometimes the mission is important as well. So working with the companies I'm working with right now, uh, one's helping to assist small businesses in running, their bus in running themselves and not falling into problems with cash flow management, the tax man. We're enabling businesses to stay afloat that otherwise might mismanage themselves into the ground within the first few years before they can afford to hire, uh, hire an FD. We're having great success in hiring people purely on the basis of that mission because so many people resonate with it. They've had family members who've run small businesses, they've done so themselves, they might have been contractors, they recognise these problems and they want to get involved. That's worked really well. Leading into the kind of diversity piece, that helps too, because if you've got uh, kind of alignment around core values or a mission, then you get all kinds of people who want to do that thing rather than being attracted to the cultural aspects. And sometimes where I've worked in organisations where we've emphasised hiring for a culture, that tends towards monoculture unless you're extremely careful with it. If you set yourself up around aligning on values and the things you want to see in the kinds of people you're working with and where they should be heading in a direction, then you'll attract a wider set of people. That's not to say that it's about casting as wide a net as possible. The, the kind of degenerate case of that is you chuck a job description on indeed.com and let everybody apply for it. Um, it's more about going where people are. So we're focusing at Flashpatch, travel company I'm working with, we're focusing on going to the places where the, the more diverse candidates are. So working with various code academies and things like that to try and find candidates from different backgrounds, socio socioeconomic as well as age and all the other different aspects of diversity. Um, rather than just focusing straight on gender, for example. So making an effort to, to spread, spread ourselves out and go to where people are. The other thing that we're doing is trying to, Im trying to embed this all the way from the top down. So Flashback is female-led, um, and all the way down from talking to investors, trying to work with investors who've got at least female representation on their boards, and trying to work with recruitment consultancies who have a more diverse makeup as well, and trying to really embed that all the way through to ensure we get the widest possible array of candidates. Okay, and have any of you got uh, an experience with positive discrimination and whether or not that's something that, that you feel comfortable with in your organisations? Yeah, so I'm happy to talk to that. So um, we actually, for our hiring process, we've made changes to make sure that for every role that we hire that we do have a diverse slate. I think that's really important. I, I wouldn't consider that to be positive discrimination in the sense that, you know, jobs get offered to people that aren't able to do those jobs. I don't think that's helpful for the candidate or for the firm. But certainly make sure you take the time to, to build that pipeline, to have a lot of kind of programs for supporting people that want to return to work that might have been out for periods of time to start a family, reach out and provide paths and extra coaching back to that can be a very difficult process, anxiety inducing process for people that used to be, you know, very high performing in business and then go away and have a family and then worry about their ability to reintegrate. So there are some specific things that you can do that I think are generally helpful to create a diverse workforce and that, that you could class as positive discrimination um, that actually I, I kind of see that more on the supportive side rather than, like I say, you know, reducing the opportunities for anybody else as such. Okay, great. 
All right, so we've got our talent, and, and they're reasonably diverse. Um, the challenges that we face as businesses uh, seem to be becoming increasingly more, more complex. Um, we heard Mark earlier from Trainline talking about how he felt culture was really, really important to be able to address that, but he talked about the technology quite a bit. Florian talked about the technology a lot, and there are considerable challenges there. I'm sympathetic, having worked in Sky, for those. Um, Steve, perhaps you could tell us about um, Metapack and, and how you've used technology to make sure that you're staying at the forefront of all of the challenges that you have um, in the logistics of your business. Bearing in mind recently the high street in particular and the retail market seen some, some high profile problems. How, 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 have, how do you stay fresh with your technology and um, ensure that you <coughs> get benefit there? We, we remove every conceivable barrier to getting our engineers as close as possible to the strategy. They understand what they need to do. We don't choose and debate technology because they're only interested in value creation. Ev literally everything in our business that is not direct related to value creation is a byproduct. Platform engineering, they're amazing. They're a byproduct. I am a byproduct. My job is to help the, p the team get as close as humanly possible to delivering that value. So we find that technology comes as we solve, want the problems to solve them. And we find that in our market, um, there's a, there's, a, there's a clear line between people understand value creation through technology and people who do it because they think they should. It's about do they do genuinely understand the drivers of competitive advantage, how to make it divert, um, dynamic, and how to keep their business developing on a constant basis. So we see uh, every business I've ever worked in, I see exactly the same trend where, where you have that clear, your purpose, and it's, it's dynamic. Technology is a byproduct. It's just a thing you need to make it happen so it doesn't become a debate. So I would say it's not about technology. It's about clarity of purpose, clarity of strategy, understanding of how do you win and how do you, make, how do you always win, not just win today. The classic thing, I think what's happened on some of the high streets is people have won in a certain way for a long time, so they're really comfortable with it. The game's changing rapidly and diversely. There's plenty of prizes because there's plenty of people doing very, very well. Some businesses that didn't exist a few years ago are now absolutely destroying it globally. Some of them are London-centric. Um, you know, it's just about how, un how quickly you understand the diverse nature and the dynamic nature of the market you're in and how you organize yourself to do it. Technology is just the knitting you get there with. Okay, that's great. So, um, if, if what you're saying is you're removing those barriers between technologists, have any of you got experience of how sometimes techies just want to code, just want to do some building of some kit, and they're not actually interested in the wider business? And how have you addressed that from a, a getting them engaged? So, it's great that there's no barriers there, but then how do you get those guys engaged in what the business is doing rather than just the tech? Anybody got any experience with that? I mean, all days. I mean, a lot of techies are just that, techies, and they're not interested in the wider world, and they just want to dabble in things. But in some ways, again, if you have a diverse team, you, you, in the team you need a leader who gets it. And he can take these people along and has to take these people along. And again, I think our job is to build these teams or the structures which can build these teams to be successful. If you, if you can't, I mean, the world is moving way too fast to have people there who are just sitting there and sort of want to spend eight hours a day um, typing. You know? They need to understand what you're up to, and that's all about communication. You need to make that happen. You need to tell people um, what's going on. You need to treat them as adults, and if you do that, then generally we try to hire people who want to be in the office every day and want to do well and want to do the right thing. And if you enable these people to get their things done and give them everything they need, and especially the understanding of what's needed, then you'll be successful. Okay. Okay, so uh, moving on a little bit. Um, Paul, how about uh, thinking about tactical business strategies or, or, or tactical business plans versus long-term strategy, right? So given the fast-changing environment that <coughs> we're in today, you know, we've all got long, big five-year plans, uh, and then then there's things like the the B word, which I won't go into. But you know, buggering everybody up a little bit because nobody's sure about what the next you know six months is going to look like. So, how do you operate tactically, and and is that the right thing to do, in order to align with your future strategy? What experiences have you got there? Yeah, I mean, I think this is something that any 
fast moving business has, right? So you have kind of the, the, the pressure for short term customer need and you want to chase that customer need versus the knowledge that, you know, if you take shortcuts in the short term, you're going to go slow in the long term. Um, so I think there's a, there's a few different levels of that. Um, pragmatism has to come in at some point. Uh, we can't all be idealists and, 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 and purists. Um, but there, there needs to be a peer relationship, I think, with the people that are selling the products or defining the product strategy to understand the consequences of decisions that are made. And often those decisions are made in a, in a back room somewhere and, and aren't transparent. Um, I think there comes a point when you have to adopt the persona of a, of a doctor patient rather than a, an order taker, right? So, um, you know, I, I think as, you know, we would consider ourselves to be professionals. If you consider yourselves to, yourself to be a professional, you have a set of professional standards. Um, and, and so there are certain corners that I think you have to take your line of sand and say, actually, I'm not going to cut past there because I know that that's going to damage you and the ability to, for you to run your business in the long term. Um, but I think if you've got a peer relationship with the business and you've got their best interests in mind, empathy to the short term, but constant of the long term, and all of these products live for a very long time, then you can have that peer uh, conversation and if the relationship's good you don't often have to kind of pull out the doctor card and say actually for this thing no I'm not going to cut because I mean Mark's talk at the beginning you can't get to a position where you're releasing 350 times a week if you don't make an investment in that chain which might in the short term go against what the business wants to chase that week or the week after but it is going to lead them to a, finan you know, to a uh, materially different place in the future where you can survive some of the challenges that we just talked about there. Okay, so that's interesting. One of the key things you said where, there was that getting the business bought into that, which kind of aligns what Steve was saying about keeping everybody, including the technologies, close to the business purpose and mission. So I'm guessing as, as CTOs in, in, in the current world we live in, you've all been tasked at some point or other in the last few years with implementing a digital transformation. Might not have been called a digital transformation, but we've all been, yes, we're going to digitally transform everything. So how have you tackled the issue that sometimes that becomes an IT technology problem when, when really transformation should be a whole business challenge? Anybody want to pick that up? Toby. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I was lucky to join this, this, this organisation in 2008 when, yeah. You know, Obviously, the business was very much uh, you know, about to be digitised or was in the minute. And no one really knew what to do because we'd basically given it all away um, previous to that. We were trying to get it back in. So, so really, uh, certainly the experience at the Telegraph is everybody is behind this transformation thing. We don't talk about transformation because it, it's certainly, from my point of view, it seems to be a, continual, a continuum. I mean, it, I don't think we've ever said, right, we're going to do a transformation. We're going to do a transformation. We're going to do a transformation. It's sort of just been a thing that's happened all the time, continually, because we absolutely have to. I mean, talking about you know, we were earlier about having a mission and an imperative. The imperative for us is if we don't, then this industry is just not going to be around in five years. You know, I'm sure people still want to read the news from a, from trusted sources, but but there's so many other places to go. So we absolutely, it's, you know, it's it's an absolute imperative that we transform and continue to do it. So so recently, I mean because of sort of various other sort of headwinds in the industry. In the last couple of years, we've pivoted to a subscription only, um, not a subscription, a subscription led strategy and focusing just on the journalists, or not just on the journalists, but solely on the quality journalism. And that's been one thing, and we've got one thing that we're all behind, which is we've got a strategy that says in 2023, we need to have 10 million registrants and 1 million subscribers. And that's what everybody's doing. So if you had a chance to look at some of the screens over there, yeah, everybody can see them, and they can see on a minute-by-minute minute basis if we're hitting those goals, what we're doing today against the goals, so we've got good pacing, what we're doing by month, what we're doing by year. And we're halfway through it as well, which is good. We're, we're halfway there pretty early, which is great for us. But it means, and everybody downstairs producing the content that we sell can see exactly what they're doing. And so, so the transformation is happening on a daily basis, and it's, you can actually feel it. You can walk down onto the floor and sort of and see it, and you can look down on it, which is really important. I mean, we're lucky to be a small company in the one place, so everybody can see what's going on in a transformation, even though we don't call it that because we're all right in the middle of it. So I don't think we've had that issue. Okay, that's great. Rory? Yeah. Um, I guess I'll jump in, having spent a couple of years doing a public sector agile transform transformation in the relatively recent past. And I think the thing that, that underlies what you've spoken about there is energy and enthusiasm. It's very easy uh, as you know, directors, leaders in a company to go, we're going to transform, we're going to do this, and to lose the people that you have to take with you. Mm -hmm. And if they're not fully bought in and, dare I say, aligned or behind that mission themselves, then 
all you'll ever get will be lip service. And it's about making sure that everyone, and I guess this kind of comes back to your point, Steve, of making sure that everyone understands what we're doing and getting as close to the value as possible. But if you haven't got everyone right down to the grassroots, really bought into the benefits to the company, to them, to their customers, of changing the way that they do business or the organization operates, then you're on a losing battle. Um, public sector experience I had was that what we needed to do, despite being in there to lead the transformation, was to spend our time right down in the weeds with the teams, showing them how to use new technologies, new tools, work in new ways, in practical hands-on ways to get them enthused about the things that they could learn and the ways they could develop themselves and deliver value to the citizens that they were serving. And if we didn't do that, it was, oh, yeah, I'll turn up to work tomorrow and do as I'm told, but I don't really understand why we're doing this. So, Steve, in your experience, do you think that we shouldn't be talking about digital transformation anymore and we should really be changing the word digital to business transformation? We shouldn't have been talking about it in the first place. Just <laughs> give people something to sell. Um, uh, it's true. Um, it's a load of rubbish. Um, I've had a job. I worked with a chap over there. Um, I had a digital transformation director job. We did strategy and we made things happen. We told people the mission and we got on with it. For me, I think it all comes back to some very simple principles. Um, Dynamic change is the new norm. Get used to it. Stop moaning about it. Um, it's going to get harder. It's going to get faster. And the consequences are bigger. Because there's people out there with unlimited money who are just going to eat your industry when they choose. Um, the reality is you get absolute clarity of purpose. You relentlessly communicate it. You relentlessly communicate it again. And when you go to sleep thinking, that's all I've done, you might have done enough. Then you find the cohorts of people who just they passively resist and then they don't want to and then unfortunately it's time for them to leave that's the hard reality because if you look at any high performing business that's how they operate it's just normal they're just lots of businesses are finding out that because business models are changing business <coughs> markets are changing and business cycles are changing all driven by technology the game just gets harder and therefore you're just going to have to make quicker better decisions so for me it's just a reality check that's dressed up in a nice way and actually, it's always been that way, and the people that are brilliant at it are still brilliant at it and hyper-successful. And it's just a question of finding the path for your business, and, and there's something Mark said that was perfect. It's your way, the way it works for you. Not out of a book or what some consultant tells you. It's your way and how you decide to do it. How, how well you do it may predict your future, but it's about bravery, and often um, management teams are, they have collective passive fear and they're not sure what to do. And you have to find the moments to break that. And to, to take the, you know, and that's, as a technologist, it's often the only chair in the room that can do it because you're the person that sometimes knows about the future. So you can take the personal risk. I've always taken lots of personal risks, so I'm all right if I get sacked. I'm okay with that. My wife's all right with it, you know. You just gotta get there, and then, then you gotta take the risk. Otherwise, you end up watching it. And admiring a problem isn't, it's not cool. Okay, so a little bit of bravery involved there, definitely. Um, so we're going to open up to the floor now for questions. Um, we're going to finish by coming back to you guys at the end, so I'm just giving you a bit of warning. And we're just going to do a, a quick one-liner from each of you on what you would have told your, your uh, let's say, less senior self 10 years ago to help you get to the, the heady heights that you guys are at now. Obviously in the room we've got you know people who are senior but people who may be aspiring to get to the sort of uh, uh, roles that you guys have. So that would be really useful I hope for, for the audience to hear about those career progressive moments that, that resonate with you guys. But for now we're going to open up to the floor, uh, see if anybody's got any questions for these guys. Um, either, either ask uh, one directly or, uh, or just throw the question up and I'll pick for you. I'll go for one, David. That's, that's, that's go on, John. Let's hear from you. There's lots, lots of things you talk about very positive about your company's organisations. In terms of your workforce, what would be the one frustration they would share that you need to deal with? If there's no one, then when will the one come and will they all be in a room for the day? I'm not, I'm not going to pick Toby because he grimaced when you asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to... Uh, uh, Steve is, Steve's looking keen and eager. Uh, time. Time, it's the, we know where we need to get to, we understand the domain model, we know what it's going to feel like, but we've just got stuff to do. And it's something we talk about a lot, you know, we've talked about wanting to kill 10 months and appear where we know we're going to get to. Because we know that um, incredible opportunities sit there, it's just a question of getting there. And it's something we do talk about a lot, and then it's, the flip side of that is, but we're going to do it properly. 
because we're not doing it twice and we're not fixing it. We're going to do it once and well at Momentum. And it's, it's a constant dialogue and there is no magic apart from different knitting, but that changes slowly. That was a great question. I can't resist the temptation to have a go at it as well. I think there's one thing, and this might come up in the category of things I would have told myself 10 years ago as well, which is the ability for people to say no to things. It's such a powerful word, no. And, and most people that you work with are really well-intentioned and want to do a good job and want to make people happy and want to produce great products and want to do all the things, and you can't. There is always functionally infinite demand and by saying yes to one thing, you're saying, you know, you're saying no to everything. If you keep saying yes to things, you can't get anything done. So being really deliberate on the outcomes, it's been said a few times here. What are you actually trying to achieve? And of all the things that you could do, what things should you definitely not do to enable you to do a small number of things to achieve those outcomes? That's something that I've seen you know, across this industry and I'm sure in others at multiple firms. Yeah, I probably have to chip in on that. That's probably the one thing which my people would complain about, change of priority, where the business just says, oh God, we can do this deal, and we, like last year, oh, we can acquire Zeri R. Okay, we said we wouldn't go to Italy because the internet isn't good enough. Oh, who cares, we can buy Zeri R. Okay, so, and that means obviously pivoting for everybody because you need to do integration, market, um, spin that up with a few, within a few weeks. And it's obviously these death marches, which we probably all know, um, which you, hopefully you survive in the end, but which are a massive drag on um, people and their motivation. Okay. Any response, John, or is that okay? That's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, anyone else got a question? Uh, speak speak loudly. Oh, there you go. Uh, yes, I'm also from a, a very old established company which has been doing a digital transformation because you know we're a print company and that didn't exist 200 years ago. And our infrastructure and all of our products um, have an awful lot of legacy because a lot of people use it. Journalists are used to doing a certain thing and changing that landscape gradually and progressively and without breaking things is quite a challenge. So I'm quite interested, particularly in your view, in how you handle that and what's the best strategy. So. I'll go back to this, uh, the point when we said we never did transformations. We've tried to do some newsroom transformations in the past, and a load of them have involved getting people in, sitting down for six months and doing a big plan. But in the end, we, took, we looked at it as an engineering challenge and put engineers on the newsroom, which they're not there now, but they might, they might still be. One of them's in it. <laughs> um, and actually sat there amongst the people that use the products and were super, super responsive to their needs. And that, that we did more in a year like that than we did in 15 years with the standard, you know, the transformation thing. I mean, that still doesn't address the fact that, yes, there's a bit of legacy still there because, you know, when you're in an industry that is fairly niche and fairly old, there aren't too many people selling products that service your need, your industry. So there aren't many people and they haven't got a massive amount of um, incentive to invest in their technologies. So we still have that problem. So we have to sort of manage our way around that because, yeah, we are print and we are digital. I mean, the newsroom is both. I mean, you can't really tell who's doing either. Everybody does the same thing. But really, it was to look at it as, OK, this isn't a project management or a program management problem. There are things we can do if we put engineers right down there and direct line them into the people that need their product, which is the, the digital editors of the circle down there. So that's one way. That, and that's, that's one way we've attached that thing. Um, so similar experience in a couple of different places and again it's about pushing decision making and ownership down to the teams who know the product and the domain best and then backing them when they ask for things. So if they come to you and say we need time, resource, kit in order to solve this problem then you have to give it to them and trust them to make the right decision and that relies on having the right people in the right places so it might, time to get, it might take time to get there or you might lose some people along the way but if it's important enough then you have to centralise all that effort on the teams and let them crack on with it. Great, thanks guys. Uh, another question from the floor? Right at the back there. Cheers. I, I'm assuming the panels had to work with people who don't get it, um, tech and digital, and, and sometimes these people are senior, and uh, you've got to work with them. So, um, you know, I've seen companies fly them out to San Francisco, take them on a jolly, or, or teach them to code for, 
for, for the hell of it. And I guess have you got any better tricks? <laughs> sure, Steve. Talk to them openly, honestly, candidly, on their own. Eventually, if you keep doing it, and you keep doing it, they'll tell you their fears. It's only fear that's the barrier. They're normally in charge because they're bright and they know what they're doing, but they don't know what they don't know. At some point, they'll tell you it. I've seen people do it in the most incredibly unlikely places. Um, but that's my experience 100% of the time, that once people are prepared, they feel comfortable enough and trust you enough to have that conversation, at some point, they randomly will. Probably in a taxi or at seven in the morning when they phone you, but they will. You just have to be patient. If they, if they don't, don't force it because they're only going to do it when they're ready. And I think, Steve, we were talking uh, before the panel about um, understanding what their incentives are, what their drivers are, yeah. and sometimes, you know, they're scared. Yeah, sometimes they're scared that they're going to look silly. Sometimes they're scared they're going to lose their bonus or, at worst, their job. So, again, how do, how do you address those kind of things? I think that it comes back to purpose. If you've got an organisation that is entirely focus around uh, pleasing stakeholders. You just have to find what speeds pleases the stakeholders and um, may, just understand, don't, don't admire and forget the fact that that's what people are motivated by. So if you work in somewhere that makes oodles of money and they're only interested in self-preservation, accept it. Don't expect miracles. Don't expect them to transform because they're not going to my advice would be to go and work somewhere else more interesting but um, um, you have to you have to f really understand the true motivations and why individuals are motivated in the way they are and get to it with them and the fear often if you can take one or two individuals and get them to ex really open up about what they're worried about and it's normally nothing to do with you know the reality of what you're talking about it's always a bunch of things normally someone's told them um, you can then start to, you have to be brave and in the, you know, in the boardroom say, so here's what I think we're afraid of. What else are we afraid of? You know, eventually you get to a conversation that's like, oh, okay, that's what it really is like. That's my experience. Okay. You might get sacked doing it, but if you don't, get, if you don't do it, you're probably going to be bored or sacked anyway. Okay, cool. Can I chip back in again? Yeah, sure. Um, so in the last couple of years, a couple of my key learnings have been around, uh, you, can, you can give it a, a label and call it radical candor, and there's a whole book around that. Um, but saying it how it is and expecting everyone else to be able to take that as it's intended and work with it on that basis. Um, one of the biggest learnings I've had has been working in a, a very high-pressure environment in the gaming industry over the last couple of years. And... I was told in no uncertain terms that when I started that the way the organisation worked was you put the tech person and the product person together and you put them in each other's pockets and you make them understand each other fully and that peer relationship is what breeds trust and respect and then ultimately creat creativity and leadership for the team below that. If you're in a situation where you've got stakeholders who don't at least trust and respect that the other person's working in everyone's best interests, that's where the problem comes from. So sometimes you kind of have to rip the plaster off and get those people to go and have that honest conversation or argument, shout at each other for a bit, go to the pub afterwards, get to know each other as humans a little bit and work out you know, where the fear lies, as Steve was talking about. Um, that that lesson is going to stick with me for a while because it worked really well. Great. There you go, Adam. A whole new thing you can go into work with tomorrow, right? Well done. Uh, so uh, we've got time for one more question from the floor and then we're going to come back for the, the quick career advice tips. Anybody else got a question? Let me be cheeky here. As people progress from being techies towards being managers, they are at their most dangerous. Why? Because they haven't abandoned their techie opinions, which are now obsolete, and have yet to achieve the state of grace of being a manager. How do you deal with these people? <laughs> from my experience, the most difficult thing I ever did, because I used to work in startups, and in a way, what we are doing here is a startup, and has probably well, we 2,700 people now. It's still very startup y, and I used to do everything. And at some point, you have to let it go, and even worse, you have to accept that other people know it better than you. Okay? So that even nowadays, even if I wanted, I couldn't go in and fix it, recognize that, live with it get other people to hire 
hopefully brighter people than themselves, give them the trust, give them the possibility to work, and then you'll be successful. And that's, that's the whole secret for me, that if I can hire people who know these things better than I do and give them the tools to be successful, then we're going to be successful. Otherwise, um, we're just going to sit there and I'm going to try to fix it all day long, which doesn't scale, doesn't work. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think another thing, and it might be a little bit tangential, but you achieve as I'm allowed to be, is that you have to have a look at the incentive system of what's leading that individual to move from being a technologist to being a manager, because it may be that they've developed this passion um, uh, for, for leading people and leading organisations and coaching others and helping to achieve results through others. Quite often, actually, in you know the firms I've worked at in the past, certainly, they're incented to move in that direction because they can't get career progression if they don't. Yeah. And that's a big, big problem, which is why, you know, the companies now, we have career tracks that enable you to get up to, you know, in our sector, kind of managing director level and still be hands-on and, and your influence and your impact yeah. is felt through how you bring that technical capability to a large scale of engineers without having to say that I manage 500 people. I've known some engineers that have made fantastic managers. I've known some engineers that have made awful managers and have gone that route and have been happy when we've gone in this direction to adopt better ways of working to throw those shackles off and get back at the keyboard and produce those things. So it's an individual thing, but having a look at why people are going in that direction is, I think, part yeah. of it. It's a very fair point. I mean, we do that. We have sort of an individual contributor track. So if, if you want to be a principal, if, if you want to be a senior um, architect, you can do that and you can be on the same career level as a manager. And that's very important. Um, just, again, looking at people and bringing out the best in them. People are all different, again, diverse teams. You need different capabilities in our team to be successful. Building these teams, that's the important bit here. And at the same time, yeah, keeping interesting and offering people career progression. Great, okay, hope that helped. Um, so we're just gonna, I think we'll start with you, Florian, and work our way around. We're gonna do a quick one or two lines on uh, something that, that you wish you'd maybe told yourself in terms of uh, developing your career and getting you to the heady heights that you're at now. Probably take more risk. Um, might sound stupid, but I was around, uh, obviously I'm 51, um, during the, the first dot-com craze. And I sat in, in my warm and cozy um, football data um, cubicle and was a managing director there and all of these things, but I should have gone out and done something dot com -y, but didn't. So take more risk. It's not obvious you're 51. It's, <laughs> my, it's my job to say things Thanks. like that. So. <laughs> um, I, I think for me, probably a, a couple of things. I think... And, and, and it's echoing some of the things that we've already heard, right? So, so being really deliberate on what the needs of the person that's consuming your product or service really are and being really deliberate about whether or not you're meeting them, how other people meet them, how you measure that, turning that into data is, is super important. It enables you to kind of get rid of some of the fluff around the edges that, that you think is helping but, but, but isn't. And then understanding that work happens within a system um, and, and as you get more senior, your job is to understand those systems and, and you know, the, the environmental aspects that lead to those systems behaving in the way that they do in it and how you can optimise that so that other people can be more effective and happier inside of those systems. Uh, I think those are things that I would have liked to learn earlier. Okay, thanks, Paul. Toby? I think I've got a couple. One's really simple and it's, it's um, take things personally but don't take them personally, which is like, which I wish I'd learned when I was younger. Whereas, you know, you, know, you should own and be accountable for everything you do but when people get pissed off and annoyed, it's not about you, it's about something else. Um, so that's what, and also the one about knowing, and I think knowing what, what, where you are, knowing what sort of gig you're on, what sort of tour of duty you're on. You know, are you there because you're paying the mortgage? Are you there because you started the company? Or are you there you're trying to fix the company? And it, they're all different, and which one are you on? And don't get, if you know which one you're on, you, you get a lot less stress, I think. Okay, some good advice. Rory? Um, mine is to, I guess, keep learning, keep absorbing information. A huge part of what I think we do as senior tech people is pattern matching. It's taking stuff we've seen in one organisation or one situation and applying it slightly differently somewhere else and trusting that because it went this way before, you understand how it's going to apply and then trying to explain that to people. I find it very hard to do that if I'm not constantly listening to things, reading things and trying to keep on top of all the new stuff that's going on in the world. So keep learning. Um, I'd say be endlessly curious um, and um, find a way to or spend more time understanding people's mindset and really thinking about that than perhaps beating them overhead with a logical hammer.
because that, that's the skill you've got rather than the one you haven't got. Okay, that's some great advice there. So, uh, Steve, Rory, Toby, Paul, Florin, thank you very much. Hopefully that was of some use to our audience.